We'd come running out of the tunnel, yellow warm-ups, UCLA. We were it, we were the stuff. We were expected to win, and we expected to win. The game itself was a celebration of life. They were basketball royalty. Everybody wanted to see it. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. Such a joyful explosion of youthful enthusiasm. But it was a time of tremendous upheaval. This is the age of Nixon and Vietnam. The riots and black power. Guys were coming back in body bags. That's not acceptable, and we're not going to let that happen. We didn't want to be called boy anymore. We were a microcosm of what the real world was like. And here was this centered Midwestern guy in this sea of insanity. We had no idea what he was teaching us. We thought he was crazy. Somehow he managed to sail a ship, a championship year after year after year. How many people get to be involved in what they call a dynasty? From 1964 to 1975, the UCLA Bruins were a symbol of excellence. Their achievements on the basketball court, staggering. 10 NCAA championships in 12 years, including seven consecutive titles, four undefeated seasons, 38 straight tournament victories, and a record 88-game winning streak. In establishing perhaps the greatest sports reign of all time, UCLA transformed college basketball from a regional game into a national spectacle. It was a dynasty built on the shoulders of a passionate and idealistic group of young athletes. Part of a generation increasingly concerned with the direction of the country, as eager to be active on campus as on the court. But while the world continued to change and the rosters turned over, one element at UCLA remained constant, John Wooden the genteel-looking coach who for over four decades led the Bruins to immortality. A former All-American and English teacher, Wooden's guiding principles never strayed far from the Indiana farm where he was raised. A lot of our offense really came out of our defense. UCLA would score baskets in bunches. They'd be 10 points ahead, and then suddenly they'd be 25 points ahead. Those guys were passing and running and passing, dun, 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 and finally there's the open man layup, dun, 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 dun. Passing, 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 shot Gail Goodrich, boom, left-handed. Walt has her passer, ball hand, just a genius, man. The finesse, the grace, the ballet. Triggered by the zone press, the Blitz and Bruins held opponents to just 70 points per game during an improbable, undefeated regular season. The National Collegiate Basketball Championship is on the line at Kansas City. The game offers the rare spectacle of a team with a perfect record, UCLA, the underdog because the experts... From the opening tip, Duke's size proved little match for UCLA's quickness. The unlikely hero was sophomore Kenny Washington, who came off the bench to add 26 points. The Bruins rolled to a 15-point victory to cap a perfect season and their first NCAA crown. Humbled, perhaps, but John Wooden's good fortunes continued in 1965 as UCLA repeated as national champions. In the process, his electrifying team changed the basketball culture in California. To a generation of West Coast kids new to the game, basketball was UCLA. Coach Johnny Wooden guided his basketball Bruins to their second straight NCAA title with All-American Gail Goodrich igniting their attack. Number 25, All-America Gail Goodrich is playmaker. It all came together for me that day when I watched Gail Goodrich, Stumpy, race around that court. Yes. As they skin the Wolverines 91 to 80. Myself that day, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to play like that. I want to play for UCLA. I want to play for Johnny Wooden. I want to be a part of a championship team. Wood, Alcindor was on his own for the very first time, an 18-year-old oddity in an unfamiliar world. 
Franklin. This great recruit that everybody had read about was going to play his first game. And he completely demolished him. People around us were just going, oh my god. But they're only the second best team on the campus. After embarrassing the defending champs by 15 points, Lou Alcindor and the Brew Babes dominated their freshman foes. Alcindor led the way with 31 points per game, as the Frosh won by an average of 56 points and gave Bruin fans a glimpse of an emerging dynasty. Here he is, Lou Alcindor, 7 feet 1 and 3 eighths inches, literally the biggest attraction in collegiate basketball. The 19-year-old sophomore from New York City makes his varsity debut for UCLA. The big man moves with amazing grace, and he can make almost any shot appear as easy as this. Yeah, purposely, I wanted him to throw a scare into the other teams. Alcindor scores 56 points, and it's only the beginning. He could score 20 points before he got out of the locker room, it seemed. He was so graceful. I remember him stealing a pass, taking three steps from the top of our key to the other, threw the ball down, and smashed these guys in the first row. And him to cut off the middle. He would try to catch one jump shot every couple of games, block it, and laugh. Don't bring any of that weak stuff in here. You know better than that. Eat with us. Really be inventive on how we're going to stop this guy. Sense of what it would be like trying to drive the lane against Goliath. Alcindor, but they couldn't stop Shackelford. They couldn't stop Warren. They couldn't stop me. Lynn Shackelford could shoot 20, 25 footers and make nine out of 10 of them. And Mike Warren was so good, if they left him open, people would have to come at him. He'd just go around them because he was too quick and too good with the ball. They had an air about them that was frightening to a degree. Watching that team, that just forced you not to like them. Their whole demeanor, you can't beat us. Superiority, winners, champions. In 1967, junior Mike Warren and UCLA's sophomore studded lineup went undefeated to become the youngest team ever to win a college title. The team was so unstoppable that just three days after the final, the NCAA developed its own defense of Alcindor. Outlawing the dunk was a clear attack on Alcindor's dominance, but did nothing to stop the Bruins in 68. UCLA won its first 17 games of the season to run its record to 47-0 since Big Lou's arrival. The Bruins' dominance grabbed America's attention and posed the question, was UCLA unbeatable? The answer came January 20th, 1968, in what was billed the game of the century. Largest paid audience to ever see basketball anywhere at any level. Where do you put the court? They decided to put the court exactly in the middle of the Astrodome. No one had a good seat. Driven off to Hayes, who scores. Hayes again. Alvin Hayes has 31. It's like two little kids. If that person have... Cinder with Spain on him. Blocked by Hayes. Listen to the Texans. Alvin Hayes scored 39 points. I'd never seen anything like it. That game was the platform from which the popularity of college basketball catapulted into the stratosphere. UCLA may have assumed the role of Goliath, but it was the American public who was smitten. A record television audience tuned in, proving college basketball could sustain nationwide interest. Even in defeat, UCLA provided the NCAA with its watershed moment. Two months later, with a healthy Alcindor, UCLA avenged its loss to Houston with a resounding 32-point victory in the national semifinals en route to another blue and gold championship. The Bruins were on top of the world, but it was a world increasingly unstable. Just 12 days after UCLA won its fourth title in five years, despite the racial divides of the era, the players remained united on the court. Lou Alcindor completed his brilliant Bruin career with 37 points in the 1969 title game. UCLA's fifth championship was the third of the Alcindor era, during which the team won 88 of 90 games. The three-time Collegiate Player of the Year graduated that spring with a degree in history, allowing coaches everywhere to finally exhale.
We've just lost the greatest center that anybody ever seen in college basketball. And a lot of pent up. We just thought that we were going to continue to win. When you have better history, it was just part of what we were supposed to do. Referring to the loss of Alcindor, John Wooden called his 1970 Bruins the team without. But the squad did possess a more balanced attack. Senior floor leader John Vallely teamed with sophomore Henry Bibby in the backcourt and Steve Patterson at center. Anchoring the Bruins in the front court was Curtis Rowe and the irrepressible Sidney Wicks. His next two years, he was the best college forward in the country. Of course, he will tell you he was that other year, too. Wicks became a force for the Bruins during a surprising 28-win season, but he never lost his swagger. Early in the 1970 final, UCLA had no answer for Jacksonville's artist Gilmore, widely heralded as the next Alcindor. Trailing by nine in the first half, the two sides of Sidney Wicks aligned in perfect harmony. We didn't really have anybody to guard Artis. He was 7'2 and, and on a tall day. And Sidney was the one who said, Coach, you gotta let me play behind that guy. And I said, you can't guard him behind Sidney. Yes, I can. He said, I'll show you. He said, all right, Sidney, go ahead and do that. Sidney Wicks just took over the game. Sidney dominated. Completely shut him down, swatted balls, threw things down in his face, and just completely intimidated him. Sidney Wicks shut down Artis Gilmore for the last 30 minutes of the game, and the Bruins won handily by 11 points, and the dynasty continued. The following year, the Bruins were as dominant as ever. In the 71 championship game, Steve Patterson scored a career-high 29 points to give UCLA its fifth straight title. In the end, the so-called team without wasn't missing a thing. 65 years old from Martinsville, and I'm 17 years old from San Diego. Here's the three by five man. We went from one drill to another instantly. On the other end. Coach ran the same drills with the same emphasis every day. The drills that we ran on October the 15th, the first day of practice, we ran on the night before we played for the national championship. So that by the time the games came along, they just became memorized exhibitions of brilliance. When he wanted to correct a player, he had a very unique technique. There was a way to do everything. You could have taken UCLA people who played in 55, 65, 70, and 75, put them on the same team, and they would have been able to play with each other instantly. Sometimes we'd want to attain only through self-satisfaction and knowing you made the effort to do the best of which you're capable. No one can do more than that. He may not have stressed winning, but that's all John Wooden's teams did. And the Bill Walton-led Bruins were no different. The enigmatic redhead gave Wooden all he could handle off the court. But between the end lines, he was every other coach's problem. I just didn't think a 6'11 man could do. The thing that was evident about Walton was the unbelievable, unfettered joy in just playing basketball. It was infectious, it was enthusiastic. There was spirit about him that was fun to watch. Here he was, the greatest player of the era. He could do anything. He reveled in that outlet pass. He could start the fast break and bolt. Almost before he got the ball off the backboard, it'd be halfway down the court. When that ball was put up to decide the fate of Western civilization, the game itself was a celebration of life. Such a joyful explosion of youthful, a harmonic convergence of the highest order. Walton's superior play and zeal for the game easily rubbed off on teammates Greg Lee, Larry Farmer, and Keith Wilkes a silky smooth sophomore from Santa Barbara. In raising UCLA's eighth championship banner, the 72 Bruins proved not all undefeated seasons were created equal. With an NCAA record 30-point average margin of victory, the Walton gang turned basketball into theater, a full-scale production with transcendent appeal. They were basketball royalty. There was no question about that. It was just a different kind of feel. The cheerleaders would go. 
They were all gorgeous. They all looked like they'd just come off the beach. It caused quite a stir, I remember. But there are differences during the day, but when it came game time, none of that mattered. It was all UCLA basketball. It brought everyone together. I often refer to it as the Bruin Ballet. A sense of not just excellence, but almost perfection. Bill Walton epitomized that near perfection in the 1973 championship game versus Memphis State. Walton made 21 of 22 shots, and his 44 points broke the final scoring record set by his childhood hero, Gail Goodrich. Incredibly, it was the Bruins' seventh straight title, its ninth in 10 years, and second consecutive undefeated season. It was three calendar years without a loss by the time the Bruins stretched their winning streak to an astonishing 88 games. 5,000 students on the floor. You're going to tell your grandchildren someday about this moment. They're on their feet, over 11,000 here at North After leading Notre Dame by 11 points with three and a half minutes to play, the Bruins turned the ball over five times and missed their last six shots, turning Phelps' premonition into reality. The streak was gone, and with it, UCLA's air of invincibility. The loss established a dubious trend for the rest of the 1974 season, which included a tournament collapse that ended the Bruins' title streak at seven. And in recalling an era of perpetual triumph, these rare defeats cruelly linger. We lost two games to Oregon and Oregon State within 18 hours of each other. And then March 23rd, 1974, a 14-point lead with four minutes to go, a seven-point lead with 90 seconds to go in the second overtime and giving it away. Us to give four games away out of our last 10 was just totally unacceptable. And I will never be able to erase the stigma and the stain from my soul about what could have been. It could have been perfect. I think the general consensus of opinion is that every school in the conference will be stronger than they were a year ago, with the exception of UCLA. And of course, we can't be expected to with the loss of an all-time superstar like Walton, and of course, a, a real star in Keith Wilk. But uh, nevertheless, we expect to be in contention all the way. That team was a real hard hat, bologna sandwich, blue collar type of a team. I give a lot of credit to Dave Myers, who's our senior leader. Just scrappy, dive on the floor, floor burns, just do whatever it takes. Other than returning senior Dave Myers, John Wooden wasn't sure what he had to work with. But guards Pete Turgovich and Andre McCarter, center Ralph Drollinger, and forward Marcus Johnson played with a resilient style that offset the team's inexperience. The final scores were closer than in previous years, but the Bruins found themselves in familiar territory playing in the 1975 Final Four. In the semis versus Louisville, Richard Washington's jumper with three seconds remaining in overtime put UCLA into the finals. But the night took an even more dramatic turn. I want to tell you this, young man. Regardless of how the game comes out Monday, I want you to know that I've never had a team whom I've been more proud you haven't caused me a problem on or off the court this whole season, and that's a pretty nice thing to say about the last team you'll ever teach. And there was just quiet. Nobody knew it. My assistant didn't know it. I didn't know it myself just a few seconds before. The game against Kentucky would be his final game as a coach. He was retiring. Win or lose after that game. Look, man, there's no way we gonna let coach go out and not win a national championship. It was a game in which things were almost surreal. You could almost see the players playing above the floor, almost like they were running on air. It was like they were actually moving in space, and you just can't not be absorbed in what you're seeing. More than history, it was something with the ages. It was one of those fantastic moments in sports history on UCLA's John Wooden in his final coaching game at UCLA. It's a team that responded magnificently and goes out a winner. The 10th NCAA title for UCLA. The final star, UCLA. 
10 is such a perfect number. It's such a nice, round, even number. And it meant a lot and it still does to be able to send him out like he's supposed to be sent out. During UCLA's decade of dominance, the Bruins won 335 games. They lost just 22. But for the players, the true essence of their achievement fell into view only years later, as time transformed youth into wisdom. Each title endures as a moment in their coming of age, a living, breathing legacy of a teacher, his pupils, and the era in which they stood as the class of college basketball. Now, here come the Bruins, led by Walt Hazard. Here is a trophy emblematic of It's one of those things where you're not able to grasp it because it was so big. That's a lot right here, a lot of heart, a lot of courage. They were always on top, and getting to the top is hard. Staying on top is almost impossible. People said, well, he won three championships with Alcindor, two with Walt. Well, yeah, that means he won five more without either of those great players. What UCLA accomplished was never going to be equaled. It's never going to happen. It was just history in the making. They don't talk about me with the 76ers and winning that championship when I was with the Knicks. They talk about me being with UCLA. When you're part of something like that, it changes your life forever. It was the fans. It was the players that we had. It was the times. What it really was, was John Wooden. Because this is really someone who was an intergalactic treasure. This is my little grandson. There was something kind of subversive about how he taught us. We didn't get most of it when we were there. It was flying right by us, over our head, past our ears, and under us. Only later did I realize that what he was teaching us on a basketball court really start to apply that in everyday life. feel the same way. Everything he said on the court has helped us tremendously. The influence it has on you in making certain decisions, how you carry it with you going forward, how you fall back on it when you get knocked on your ass. And as our children have chased down their dreams in life, whatever it is, I'm always barking out to them, be quick, but don't hurry. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Happiness begins when selfishness ends. I'm writing on their lunch bags, never mistake an activity for achievement. The worst things you can do for the ones you love are the things they could and should do for themselves. We love Coach Wooden. Because he really did give us everything. He taught us how to learn, he taught us how to think, he taught us how to dream, he taught us how to be part of a team. He never told us the answers. He just told us how to get there.